together. Let's worship.
Good morning, and if you're our guest, we're just so thankful that you're here today. We're going to continue to worship together, but as we go into worship, I, I want you to think about something today. What makes worship worship? 
What makes worship worship is it's infused with faith. Faith that we have in Jesus Christ. Not, not the things that we see around us, the circumstances that we're in, but our eyes are focused on Him. And when we do that, there's a hope. And today, when you engage with God personally, let your heart be full of faith. Faith in Him. And when your faith is in Him, there's a great hope, an expectation that He will come. That He'll do what He says He's going to do. That's the nature of of our God, His kindness and His radical love. So today, let me encourage you to worship God with faith and hope, knowing that He will do what He says He's going to do. That's how true His promises are. Father, we come to You and we thank You in the awesome name of Jesus. We ask that You would just fill our hearts today, that our eyes would be fixed on You, not on the circumstances of life right now, because they come and go, They're up and down, but you're steady. You're almighty. You're trustworthy. And Lord, we put our hope in you today and that our hearts would be full of hope as we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray and we say together, amen. Let's worship him. Free. 
Well, good morning. Good Sunday morning. It's a good time to be together, and you're probably wondering what we're up to right now. Well, we're up to something that I've wanted to be up to for quite some time, and that was to introduce to you our housekeeping and our maintenance team. I mean, would you just let them... Why don't you stand and give them a, a standing ovation? Would you do that? Thank you, guys. Thank you, gals. Yeah. Uh, This is a great team that uh, prepares for our times to be here. Uh, So everything that we see when we get here, when it's nice and clean and it looks good, this is the team that makes it happen. And so we're so thankful for what God has uh, done for us. We've got a lot of good volunteers, and I want to introduce those volunteers to you. And uh, these, these are folks that come down every Monday, and they work on this building. They just get things ready, and they're, they're skilled at what they do. So guys, when I read your name, just lift your hand so they can see who you are. Uh, Chuck Reynolds. All right. Walt Daniels. There you are, Walt. Jim Mason. There's Jim. And then Rod Sims. And Dan Wanberg. So they're here on Mondays. They'll be here and uh, tomorrow morning, and they'll have donuts around 10 o'clock or so, because I've come down, eaten their donuts, said hi, and took off, you know, but this is a great team. Then our staff is Mike Gill. There's Mike. Jerry Campanetti. And then Juana Gonzalez. This, this is a good team. I'm So thankful for all of you, and I want uh, you to know how much you are loved and appreciated, and I hope you feel that. And uh, today what we want to do is we want to take a little time, and we want to honor someone who's missing here today. Our hearts are broken. A few weeks ago, one of our team members, Ophelia Navarro, uh, passed away, and so she's with Jesus now, and that's Ophelia and her husband, Jesus, and that is uh, Juana's aunt. And so we, we just want to um, we just want to pray over the family and, and ask God just to come and bring the comfort we need. She was a beautiful woman, helped us around here, always working, always getting things done. And so we just want to uh, thank the Lord for the time that we did have with her. So let's do that. Father, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for this wonderful team that comes together all through this week and, and uh, makes things happen around this place, Lord. Not only physical things take place, but I know with joy they work, and so there's the the presence of your Spirit alive in this team. And so we want to thank you for each member. And Lord, our our hearts are broken today. Ophelia is not with us. She's with you. And so, Lord, we just pray in your name that you would bring comfort to Jesus, to the children, to Juana and the family. Lord, we just ask that you would continue to do your work and that you would intervene. We were so thankful to have someone like Ophelia in our lives to uh, just make us better. And so we ask that you just bless this family once again. In Jesus' name we pray, and we say amen. Amen. Let them know how much you love them, would you? Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What we want to do right now is we're going to receive our morning tithe and offering. Again, if you're our guest, don't feel obligated to give. Um... What your giving does is it does help sponsor what goes on here, all the different activities that happen here and outside of here in mission. We're committed to make disciples who make disciples for Jesus. And when we come together, the team that you saw up here just a moment ago committed to that same focus, that same cause, and that is for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I want to thank you for your generosity. Let me pray and our ushers can come forward. Father, we just give back to you a portion of the things that you've given to us. We want to thank you for your generosity uh, and how blessed we are. Lord, continue to move in our lives, bring transformation and change, comfort us today, bring strength to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, it's Colin, and I want to tell you about a new opportunity that we have for pastoral care. We have these prayer cards that you see every week in the back of your seat, but we want to add an additional way to make sure that we can care for you. So whether or not you need prayer to talk to a pastor or something else, we'd like to introduce to you 
a new text to Caroline. If you'd like some care, it's as simple as this. Text the number 95577. Text the word CANDY4 REQUEST. In which you'll get an automatic reply that will ask you, how can we care for you? You will just then respond with a number and we'll have a pastor or someone else reach out to you as soon as we can. At Candy Foursquare, we care about you. This is another way that we want to be able to keep in touch with you throughout the week. So please, feel free, use it whenever, and we'll get back to you and care for you as well as we can. Thanks so much and God bless. I think I could even do that. I mean, I was uh, listening to the instructions and they can't get too complicated. In fact, my daughter called me yesterday and she said, Dad, I need you to get this app so that we can communicate. And then she just paused and realized who she was talking to. And uh, then she says this, why don't you just get a younger person to help you? Is there a younger person around there? I said, oh, come on, man. So that's the way I feel sometimes. Hey, I want to do one other thing with you this morning. If you would just stand with me and... and uh, I'm going to ask if we could just take the hands of the people next to us, even though we might not know them, and, and uh, we will get to know one another. And the reason I'm doing this this morning is I want to take a little time, just a moment, and I want to pray over our community together. Uh, we faced a horrendous tragedy last Saturday, um, domestic violence, and it was awful and horrible. But what we know is God brings hope, and what we know is He is the resurrection and the life. And we are his community, and what we want to do is lift up those that have lost, those that are mourning right now, and ask God to bring comfort and strength to their lives. Uh, we want to do this in the name of Jesus together. Father, we join hands together today, and we ask in Jesus' name that you would bring comfort and grace and strength to this community, and especially to the families that have experienced a horrific loss. We just pray that you somehow, and you do, you would redeem what has been broken, what has been torn apart. And so, Lord, we give, uh, we give these families, these individuals, to you, again, to your care. And we thank you for your grace in Jesus' name. And we say, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, we've been in a teaching series titled The Hall of Faith, and it's in this series that we're learning from the lives of Old Testament men and women. And so far, we've looked at the lives of Abraham. We looked at the life of Joseph. And today, what we're going to do is we're going to take a little time with Moses. And uh, to do that, what I'd like you to do is open your Bibles with me to Exodus chapter 2. Exodus is the second book in the Bible. If you don't have a Bible today with you, we have some Bibles around the building, under the seats. They're, they're here. They're blue, and you can pick them up, and, and uh, you can look into... Uh, Exodus chapter 2. It's the second book, again, of the Bible. What's so amazing to me in this study is how God has chosen the most unlikely cast of characters to carry out His mission. And this is amazing to me. Uh, it's amazing who He uses and how He uses them. And here's what I hope you see, and that's the power of the gospel at work. That you see the gospel of Jesus Christ at work, not only in the New Testament, but you see it at work in the Old Testament. And that's really what this is about. When I say the gospel, I mean the whole Bible. I mean it is the good news message of Jesus Christ. And that's what we look at today. Because oftentimes we'll get distracted a bit when we talk about the Old Testament and we get confused and we're not sure what that all means and how it all ties together. But it is the good news of Jesus Christ. It's wrapped up from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, the moment Adam and Eve fell and sin entered the human race, the gospel kicked in. I just love the way God radically loves us and he cares for us. In fact, you hear the first gospel message in Genesis 3.15. I mean, we're not very long into the scripture and you hear it and, and, and this is what it says. In Genesis 3.15, it says this. It says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman. This is God speaking to Satan and between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head, speaking of Jesus Christ, and you will strike his heel. Wow, what a beautiful message. In fact, theologians have a, a term for this. It's called proto-evangelum. It's, it's a theological word. Uh, I, I know what it means. It just means this, the first good news. It means it's the first message of the gospel, the first message of good news. This is God rescuing you. This is God rescuing me, that, that he's redeeming us. He's saving us. This is the gospel. 
The gospel didn't begin with the birth of Jesus or it didn't begin with the first chapter in the gospel of Matthew. The gospel began in Genesis 3, verse 15. I think that should be reassuring. Reassuring in this way is that God is always coming after us, that he always cares for us, that Adam and Eve went hiding and God went hunting. He went to look for them. His radical love pursued the sinner, the broken, and the runner. Uh, a mentor friend of mine wrote a, a book a while back called uh, from the Old Testament, especially about the Ten Commandments. Uh, the book is called entitled uh, The Tender Commandments, and it's about God's radical love, even in the commandments, even in the Old Testament. I want you to listen to what God says to Moses in Exodus 19. He says, You have seen what I did for you to the Egyptians, how I bore you up on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. That's radical love. That is the gospel message. What I want to speak about today, just for a moment, is I want to speak about the fear that oftentimes resides in our heart. That fear oftentimes has control over our lives. And the Bible says it's the perfect love of Jesus Christ, the perfect love of God that casts out all fear. You can feel fear rising. <laughs> you, you, you can feel fear around you. And what we want to be is we want to be people who live and invite the perfect love of God to, to reign and, 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 and overflow in our lives and our hearts. And so in Jesus' name, what we do here today is we speak against fear. Whatever fear you might be facing, it might be a, a fear that you face in relationship, it might be about provision, it might be about your future, your job. In Jesus' name, fear be gone and let the love of God just fill your life. Because God has the ability to take care of us. He does, he always will. He wants to take care of you, he leans into us. You see, at the time of Moses' birth, the Israelites were living in Egypt and they were living there as captives. They were living there as slaves. The Pharaoh of Egypt was the, threatened by this massive population growth uh, that the Hebrews experienced. In fact, during this time, the story that we're going to read today, that we're going to go over, it's believed that there were between two and three million Hebrews living in the land of Goshen, right outside of Egyptian territory, and they were slaves to the Egyptians. They did all the work for the Egyptians. So Pharaoh issues a decree that all Hebrew baby boys would be put to death. He was so threatened that he went into a genocide. Uh, this horrible, horrendous thing that he perpetrated on the, the people of Israel. I was thinking about our own population. The population of Portland is about 700,000 people. Imagine three times that population in the land of Goshen and you are in a Hebrew family and then this edict comes out and the cries and the wails and the pain and the heartache of losing the firstborn child, the son. This was the horror that Pharaoh perpetrated on the children of Israel. But the mother of Moses hides him for about three months until she couldn't any longer. And so she knows Pharaoh's daughters are coming and they bathe in the Nile and, and, and he, she knows the activity. She knows what it looks like and so she watches them come and go day in and day out. And she devises this plan. She puts this plan together and she goes out the same time that they're bathing and it says in Exodus 2, 3, it says, but when she could hide him no longer, that's Moses' mother, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch and then she placed the child in it and she put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. And the plan worked because Pharaoh's daughter finds him and Moses is taken in and he's adopted by the Pharaoh's family. Can you imagine a daughter going out to bathe and then comes back with a new baby? I mean, that's really, here, Pop, look what we got. We just found this baby floating around in the water and this baby is ours. The name Moses literally means out of the water. Now Moses is, is raised among royalty. He's brought up with the finest teachers and mentors and tutors. He's able to watch how business works. He's able to watch it from the inside out. But somewhere in his growing up years, he realizes, he discovers that he's a Hebrew. Uh, the event that puts Moses in the spotlight as an adult, took place in Goshen where the Hebrews lived because Moses walked out to that area and he noticed that 
an Egyptian taskmaster was beating up on one of his Hebrew brothers. Moses intervenes and what he does is he goes in and, and he kills the Egyptian taskmaster. He doesn't think anybody's watching. He doesn't think anyone's paying attention. But there were a few eyes fixed on the event that took place. In fact, the word gets back to Pharaoh. And what Pharaoh does is he chases him. In Exodus 2.15, it says, When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh, and he went to live in Midian. Now, where he was and where he ended up are thousands of miles apart. Isn't that interesting? In fact, today, it's modern Iraq. He went to Midian, which is modern Iraq today. So he took off, and he left the land. And when he left the land, he really left it behind him. He took off running, and Moses was a man who was on the run. He lived there in Midian for the next 40 years. He learns there in Midian how to be a shepherd. And I think the thing here, one of the lessons that I pick up when I read this story is that God can take those places in our lives that seem like the wilderness, that seem like places of, of being destitute, of being left alone, being by yourself, because he had to go and adjust himself to another way of life. He had to learn how to be a shepherd. You see, we're not people who can look into the future. God's the only one that can do that, so he knows how to prepare you. He knows how to prepare you for what's to come. You might be in a situation right now and you're thinking to yourself, what good, what use is this? It seems like this is a waste of time. It seems like the job that I'm doing really doesn't fit with, with, with my skills or my gifts. Uh, let me tell you this, be sure that God is at work. And that what he's doing is he's just teaching you things right now that he knows you're going to need skills that you're going to need down the road. And certainly this was a skill that Moses was going to need. He was going to need to know how to shepherd. Then one day, something amazing happens. While Moses is on the backside of the wilderness, he's tending the sheep, God speaks to him through a burning bush. Most of us know the story. But imagine yourself being in that same place. I mean, just kind of walking around, minding your own business, and out of nowhere, you see a burning bush, and then God begins to speak to you. And God begins to share his heart, his vision for you and for the people of Israel. This is amazing. It says in Exodus 3, 7, it says this, And the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. I think when Moses heard this, he was pretty encouraged. Because I wonder, like we wonder at times, does God really know what's going on in my life? Does God really care? Is he paying attention to the details? And here, God shows up in this burning bush, and he says to Moses, I'm watching after you, and not only you, I'm watching after your people, because your people are my people, and that I care for them. <laughs> but then he hears God's plan. He hears God's plan on how to bring freedom and deliverance to the children of Israel. It's in verse 10 of Exodus 3. It says, so now go, <laughs> here it is, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. You know, it sounds fun and nice when God has a plan, and, and he's telling you what that plan is, and you get excited about it, but then he looks at you, he points at you, and he says, now you're going to be involved in this plan. That's when fear comes. That's when anxiety comes. I'm thinking, you know what? Find someone else. You have the wrong address. Because I don't think I'm the one capable. I don't think I'm the one equipped to do what you're asking me to do. He's asking Moses to be the deliverer. To be the one that goes and speaks to the leadership of Egypt. And this scares Moses. It's like we all agree on the big and good things of God. But when God says, now, I want you to be involved, we backpedal just a little bit. That's what Moses is doing here. He's doing what a lot of us do. So what happens in, in the rest of God's conversation with Moses sounds like the exchange that we have with God when we feel inad, inadequate of, of some sort of task that he's asked us to do. Moses says to God, who am I? I mean, do you really want me? I, I, I can't do this. I can't stand against the Egyptians. Moses repeats that one word over and over again. He says, I, I, I. You see what this is all about? He's being pressed right now. 
I mean, he's being backed into a corner, and he's saying, I can't do any of this. But what does God do? He counters with a bigger I. It's a capital I. He says, go and tell them I am who I am. He says, go and tell them that the sovereign, all-sufficient Lord has sent you. I read that chapter, I read chapter 4 a few times, and I counted 21 eyes exchanged between God and Moses. That's a, that's a personal conversation. But when God says I, our eyes are very little now. Because God's going to have his way. He's saying to Moses, I'll provide because I am who I am. So the Lord tells Moses that he will do great things through him. And Moses still, he, he still tries to get out of God's call on his life. And here's what God does to help Moses communicate to the Israelites that he is God's chosen. Because it's not just the Egyptians he has to convince, it's his own people. And sometimes our own people are the hardest to convince. Remember it said about Jesus when, when he was in Nazareth, he said a prophet isn't even accepted in their own town. So I think Moses is realizing here, you know, I've got one thing in front of me, that's the Egyptians, but, but maybe the harder thing is my own people believing that, that I'm their leader, that God has chosen me. So what does God do? He, he, he performs three miracles with him. I mean, these are personal things that are going on between God and and Moses, because Moses asked, how will they know? What, Moses, what God tells Moses to do is to take his staff, because he was used to carrying a staff now. He said, take the staff and, and throw it down. And he does. And it turns into a snake. I, I don't know if you've ever been in a place where you've seen out in the desert or a place like that where you've seen a, a snake. Those are the snakes that you want to stay away from. And yet God says, pick that snake up by the tail. It's, it's not... That's not smart. And so Moses, he bends down, he picks it up by the tail, and it turns back into a staff. And then he says this, Moses, take your hand and put it in your cloak and pull it out again. And he pulls it out, and it's leprous. It's diseased. And he puts it back in, and he pulls it out, and it's clean again. And then the Lord says, here, there's a third one. I want you to take some water from the Nile. Pull it out in a cup, and then pour it on the ground. And when he does, the water turns to blood. Now remember when we talk about the Old Testament, we want to connect it oftentimes to the New Testament, and we want to connect it to Jesus Christ. I was reading this, and I, I recognized something in this. There's a foreshadowing of what Jesus would do. The great shepherd, the one with the staff, he would come, he would vanquish and cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness by the cleansing power of his blood. Isn't that amazing? So all through the stories of the Old Testament, especially here in the story of Moses, you see God at work pointing us to a Messiah, pointing us to the person and work of Jesus Christ. So God is letting Moses know that he is part of something much bigger than himself and that he can make a difference following God. So there's something that we all should remember, and that's this. God will never ask you to do something without enabling you to do it. You might not feel up to the task, and in fact, most of the time we don't. feel pretty inadequate. But when God calls us to something, he will always enable us. He'll always bring resource. I want you to look at Exodus 4, 10 through 13. It says this, Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to me to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. A lot of people believe that he had a speech impediment, that he couldn't get his words out clearly, couldn't get his thoughts out clearly. And then the Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouth? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. But Moses said, he comes back again, he says, pardon your servant, Lord, please send someone else. I mean, public speaking is a big deal here, you know? I mean, for all of us, it's a big deal. Uh, it is a, uh, the first most feared thing on the planet. Death is second. I love what Jerry Seinfeld said one time. He says, that means that the person giving the eulogy would rather be in the casket than standing up on the platform. And that's probably true, isn't it? 
So Moses is this guy thinking, oh my goodness, you got to find someone else because I don't speak well. I'm not eloquent. And you're going to need an eloquent speaker. But God provides. He provides. When you read this, doesn't it sound a lot like your conversations with God? God calls you or asks you to do something and you say, you know, you'd be better off if you find someone else. I think that might be true to everyone in this room. Because most of the time, that's the way we're going to respond. It's God, you, you need to find someone else. But the reality is, is God has stepped up into your life. I know when I was called, I, I said to the Lord, man, I can't do this. I'm, I'm not a good student. I, I, I'm, I, I can't go to classrooms. I can't sit and study like other people can. And I know it's going to require that I know some theology. I know it's going to require I know... Uh, a few things before I start talking about God. And that scared me to death. Public speaking scares me to death. And I told the Lord, that, I said, I, I can't do this. I'm not really that good at this. And I, I don't want to do this. I'm not patient. In my heart, I'm a very impatient person. And I thought to the Lord, I said to the Lord, Lord, you don't need an impatient person. You need a patient person. And I ran. I ran a lot like Moses did. This is so familiar to me. I'm reading the story going, oh man, the gig's up, he's got me, this is, this is my story too. And that's the beauty of God's word, that, that it's our story as well. But God is undetoured by Moses' excuses. He tells Moses how this is all going to go down. And what God says is he will use Moses to help set his people free. So what does God do? He also provides a mouthpiece. He says, hey, your brother Aaron, he will be the one that can speak. He can be the one that stands up in front of everyone and shares my word. So God will make a way in spite of our insecurities and flaws. Now notice when when Moses started giving excuses, God doesn't back down. God doesn't look at Moses and say, wow, you're so humble to think this about yourself. No, in fact, Moses was prideful because a lot of times our insecurities are just that. It's not humility, it's, it's our excuses, our statements are not a statements of humility, but of self-focus. And God's saying, I don't want you to focus on yourself, I want you to focus on me. Pay attention to me. It was kind of like the instruction that we gave this morning as we went into worship, that our eyes can be so focused on what's going on around us, our own circumstances, that, that we lose heart. And God says, have your faith put in me, and when your faith is put in me, then hope comes. So if you're still struggling with that, remember, when our faith is in Jesus Christ, that's when hope rises. And just remember that your insecurities will never be an excuse for God not to use you. We all have them. Welcome to the club. I've got a list of them. So Moses comes to this place of obedience, and he goes to Pharaoh, the leader of Egypt, This is really interesting because most historians, theologians believe that the Pharaoh at this time was Tutamasen. That might not mean much to you, but it does to the story because here's the thing. Tutamasen would have been Moses' half-brother. They would have grown up together. They would have spent time in the royal family. They would have known the same things, the same teachers, the same educators. They would have known each other. But you see, 40 years have passed, and here is this shepherd, Moses, now 80 years old, and he's stepping up, and he's doing what God's called him to do, and he stands before the king, the Pharaoh, and Moses says, God says, let my people go. Let them go. This this is a moment for the ages, face to face with the most powerful person on the planet. I mean, just imagine that. I mean, I, I uh, I think about recent history, and people who made statements that were this bold. You know, I, I think of Ronald Reagan saying, tear down that wall, Mr. Gorbachev. I think of statements that Winston Churchill made during World War II. I think of statements that go back in our history. And I think of those defining moments. And this was one of those defining moments in the life and the nation of Israel and certainly for Moses. So he stands and he says, let my people go. And what does Pharaoh do? He responds with anger he responds in a malicious way because what he does is he punishes the israelites he said oh yeah you want me to let him go tell you what i'm not going to let him go this is what i am going to do 
I'm going to ask them to still put out the same quota of bricks, but they go find the straw now. We've been bringing the straw to you to make bricks, now you go find them. Can you imagine how that went internally with the elders of Israel and with the people of Israel? <laughs> Didn't go over very well. I mean, not only does Moses have the Egyptians angry at him, he has his own people angry at him. Because they're saying, look what you did, you just made it worse. And I can say this, and I know this, this is so true, sometimes things get worse before they get better. I mean, when you encounter God, and you have a relationship with God, and He wants to get you on the track that He wants you on, sometimes there's that pain of adjustment, isn't there? I think that's what God is up to here in, in Moses' life. In other words, it was the same production with fewer supplies. Moses continues to visit Pharaoh. He continues to visit him with the same request. He says, God said to tell you, let my people go. Pharaoh refuses again and again and again. I mean, his heart gets soft a little bit, but then it gets hard again. Soft and hard. It goes back and forth. He, he's kind of a double-minded man when it comes to this stuff. And so what does God do? He brings these plagues on the Egyptians. Now, just imagine, I have to do this when I read this, what it would have been like to live in a land where these things would have happened. I, I made a list just so you understand the magnitude of what goes on there. The first is the Nile turned into blood. That's nasty. That, 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 that had to smell. And then the second is frogs, then gnats, and then swarms of flies, diseased livestock, boils, hail, locusts, darkness. All of these things, these plagues come on the land of Egypt. This is no small matter. That God is wanting to get the attention of the Egyptians. He's wanting to get the attention of his own people. And it's the last plague that changes Pharaoh's heart. This was a difficult thing because before, before this, God says, I'm going to do something. And he, and he speaks it to Pharaoh. He says, I'm going to do something that will change the course of everything that's going on. And the last plague is that the firstborn, the firstborn male in the house, in the Egyptian homes, uh, the death angel would... Would, would visit and they would die. I mean, imagine what's going on here. This has to be crazy because Moses, he responds in Exodus 11, verses 4 through 7. It says this. It says, so Moses said, this is what the Lord Almighty says. About midnight I will go throughout Egypt. Every firstborn son in Egypt will die from the firstborn son of the Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the firstborn son of of the female slave who is at her handmill and will be the firstborn of the cattle as well. So livestock are also included in all of this. It's amazing. There will be loud wailing throughout Egypt, you can imagine. Worse than there has ever been or ever will be again. But among the Israelites, not a dog will bark at any person or animal, and then you will know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. The Bible says that Moses is hot with anger and, and the tenth plague happened just as God said it would. The death of every firstborn son. There was pain all through the land. And in one night, all the firstborn males die. And the result of the last plague, God said, and they will know that I am Lord. And then Pharaoh does this. He does something that really they hadn't imagined at this point. They come to this place. They hope that he would set them free. He, he, they hope that the Israelites would have their freedom. And what happens here is Pharaoh gives permission. He gives permission for two to three million people to exit the land. Now imagine this. This is a mass exodus. This is incredible. I mean, I, I have a hard time, you know, I have a hard time going in the mall with 10 or 15 people and keeping track of everyone. You know what I'm saying? I mean, have you ever tried to move even a small crowd from point A to point B? It, it can be, I mean, it can be maddening. Because you get there and somebody's not there. Somebody doesn't show up. Here you have two to three million people and they come to this place where they're standing in front of this water, this big body of water. Before them's water, behind them is their enemy. And what do they do? What do the Israelites do? They said, why didn't you just leave us there and dig our graves? I mean, we're coming out here and you want us to dig graves out here. Look at the people. 
Look at the people that are coming after us. Now, listen to a man who was once insecure and struggles with public speaking. Listen to what he says now. Remember, just a few months ago, he said, I can't talk. A few months ago, he was saying, hey, pick someone else. And now he looks like he's perfect for the job. Isn't that the way God works? And I love what he says in Exodus 14, 13. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never, ever see again. What happens is the waters part. I mean, they had the armies. They were going out in full force here. And the waters part. And what happens is when the waters come back in on the Egyptians, it says not one soul survived. We're talking about thousands of foot soldiers. We're talking about 600 chariots. We're talking about a massive army that was motivated. They were highly motivated to go after the Israelites. Why? Because they just lost some of their children. They had just lost some of their fathers and grandfathers. They had lost people. And so they want to go after him. And again, God uses an unlikely person to do his work. Moses himself told God that he wasn't qualified. And look how God used him. It's amazing. I think the first thing that you see here is you see God delivers from slavery to freedom. Please remember that. We see a physical bondage taking place in the story in Exodus. But this goes deeper than our, 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 our physical. This goes into our spiritual. This is about our spiritual life. That the only way that we are set through, free is through Jesus Christ. And that God hates oppression and he hates injustice. He hates what the enemy perpetrates on his people. And so what we see here is this, almost like a metaphor that becomes a reality, delivers from slavery to freedom. What happens here? When God does that, we're again looking to Jesus Christ. He set us free. There's something else God does. God delivers from despair to hope because of what God has done in the past he gives us hope for the future and if you're there if if, if there's despair in your life I, I I'm going to join in with you and pray I, I've just been praying all this week for those that are facing despair dealing with despair took some time last week and just fasted and prayed and asked God to make himself real in your life Make himself real in my life. We would be people of hope, not despair. And it's because of the greatness of Jesus Christ, not because of our own greatness, it's his greatness. And then the next thing, God delivers from death to life. We're set free so we can truly live and be who God has made us to be. John chapter 10, the gospel writer, talks about abundant life in Jesus Christ that he will give us life abundant. This is about salvation, you see? This is about resurrection. Before we leave this story, we need to know what spared the Israelites from having their own firstborn sons die. You notice we didn't go to that right away because this is the way we want to finish our time together. It was because God had instructed them to take a perfect Passover lamb, to take unleavened bread before they exited. It was called the Passover and, and, and when the death angel came, he would go over the tops of those homes that had the blood of a lamb sprinkled over the doorpost. He saw the blood, and the death angel did not visit. For everyone who had no blood over their doorstep or over their doorpost, the angel of death visited. This is Passover. This is a beautiful thing that God is doing. He's saving us Today, the same way that he saved us back during the time of Moses is through the blood of the Lamb. It was the Lamb's blood that protected them. And Passover is still celebrated today. In fact, you can look at your church calendar. We're going to be having a Passover Seder or celebration in March. And you can check that out and be part of that and know exactly what the symbolisms are and know what it's pointing to. It's pointing to a Messiah, Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 22, verses 7 and 8, this is the last supper Jesus has with his disciples. And it says, they came to the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. And do you remember the story? 
that they're sitting together and Jesus lifts up the bread and says, remember, this is my broken body. And he raises the cup, which represented the blood. He said, this is the new covenant in my name. It's my blood. All of them in the room would have, would have known what he was doing, but they never had Jesus pointing back to them and saying, this is what it is all about. You see, up to this point, they weren't all together sure how this was going to be fulfilled, how this was all going to take place. And they're starting to realize, whoa, this is Jesus Christ. This is the Passover lamb. This is what our people have celebrated for thousands of years, and it's becoming true. It's taking fruition in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus would be and is the Passover lamb. So how can we be saved today? We're saved today by the blood of the lamb, Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, it says, Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. The reason it was unleavened is because leaven represented sin. And what he's saying here is because of the blood of Jesus Christ, because of his sacrifice, he has forgiven us of our sins. That before God, we stand holy. Before God, we stand without leaven. He's saying the way this happens is knowing the blood of Jesus covers our sin, that he set us free. For those that have been believers for a while, just take some time, would you, and, and go back to this place. I know we have a lot of things that we think about. There are a lot of things that we do. There's devotions that we're involved in. But if you would just take a moment and think of the significance of, of salvation in your life. And let gratitude just well up in your heart. That there has been a sacrifice made for me. There's been one made for you. This is what Moses and the children of Israel are pointing us to. This is what happens in this story. Would you do this? Would you just bow your heads with me for a moment? I want to do this. I, I want to invite, with our heads bowed, our eyes closed, I, I want to invite anyone here in this room that, that is really hungering for salvation. That... that, that, that that you just feel like you're lost right now. You just feel like life has taken a, maybe a, an odd or a difficult or hard or unexpected turn and, and you don't know where to find hope. Well, I can tell you today, God's word says all who believe on Jesus Christ will be saved. That's the promise. And if you're here today and you want to believe on Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, would you, where you are, just lift your hand. I'm not going to call you out. not going to embarrass you. I just, want, I just want good. I see your hand. Good. Are there anyone else? Just say, yeah, that's me. I need the salvation of God in my life. I need Jesus Christ in my life. Good. I see you. That's good. Good. We're going to get something in your hand, too. Uh, we want, just leave, you, leave, leave your hands up just for a moment. There's a few others. There you go. Leave your hands up there, would you? Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to get you. It's kind of, kind of a starter package you know it gives you a few directions steps to take anyone else we don't want to miss anyone in the room here today the blood of jesus powerful right here rich rich right here thank you rich right here there you go thank you we just want to we want to take time make sure that we don't miss anyone and i just want you to know man jesus just loves you and cares for you today so I'm going to ask that we do this. Everyone in this room, just pray the same prayer together. We do this as a community. It's a personal prayer for those that lifted their hands. It's a corporate prayer to remind us who's in charge, that Jesus Christ is the main thing, and we keep the main thing the main thing. So would you follow me, everyone in the room, follow me with this prayer. Dear Jesus, I see today that you are the Passover lamb. And your blood covers me and cleanses me from my sin. So today I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that you are my Lord, that you are my Savior. Come and make my heart your home. Thank you for your salvation. And thank you for eternal life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just applaud the salvation of the Lord. Will you do that? Amen.
By the way, what you do to clap at the end is scriptural. It says in Psalm that when one soul comes to faith that we rejoice. And that's what we do. We do that in this place. God is so good. Would you go ahead and stand up with me? I'm so thankful that we got to spend some time together. And for those that receive Jesus today, listen, we know that there's hope. We're going to have people up here uh, available to pray with you. You have friends that you might have come with that you can talk to about your decision to follow Jesus Christ. Don't hold it in. Be able to tell somebody about the commitment that you've made to know Jesus is, is your Lord and Savior. And then afterwards, we have our patio. There's waffles and pancakes and eggs and fellowship all there out in the patio. But again, I'm so glad that we got to spend time together. Let's do this. Let's pray. God, just thank you for your covering and your grace that's so rich in this place today. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for those who have committed their life to Jesus Christ in your name. Amen.